Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth. I'm your host, Henry Smith, and we're presented by the Associates for Biblical Research. I'm glad to have you on the, the show today, friends, watching, because today we're in for a special treat. We have Dr. John Mead with us from Phoenix Seminary, and he's the director of the Text and Canon Institute. Now, for a long time, I've wanted to get John on the program to talk about both text and canon of the Old and New Testament scriptures, and it's going to be a real treat to have him here today. So, John, welcome to Digging for Truth. It's good to see you. It's great to be here, Henry. Finally, glad we were able to make this happen. All right. Well, we're excited. I know our, our uh, audience is going to be very excited about what we're going to talk about today and the resources that you have available. So let's jump right into it, uh, John. Let's let's begin by talking about uh, what is the Text and Can Canon Institute. Uh, what's the what? Why does it exist, and and what's its goal? Good. The Text and Canon Institute is housed at Phoenix Seminary in Phoenix, Arizona, and we began. Uh, we started it. My my. Uh, co-director Peter Gurry and I started this in 2019 with the mission of illuminating the history of the Bible. So most Bible readers know that there's a history contained in the Bible, right? There's a history of Israel. There's a history of early Christianity. But fewer Christians, I find, realize that there's a history to the book itself. How did we get the leather-bound pages, right, in the English language. Uh, did it drop out of heaven on a sheet? Well, no. The short answer is no. Uh, but the Text and Canon Institute is trying to illuminate the history to show that there's actually a human component, so to speak. There's a historical element uh, for how we got the Bible, and we're trying to shine a light on that question at the Text and Canon Institute. All right. So, so maybe uh, a lot of our audience may be uh, sort of laymen, you know, people who go to church every week, uh, what you would call regular Christians, if you want to say it, not academics, in other words. And, and uh, you know, to your, to your point, it might sound a little intimidating, you know, the idea of text and canon and all this other kind of thing. So it's academic, but uh, part of your mission also is to reach the local pew. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So, so I, yes, even the terms text and canon are maybe a bit unfortunate, right? Neither one of these are English terms in some ways. Though we send text messages every day, don't we, Henry? Yeah, that's <laughs> and, right. And there are, there are always these raging debates over what belongs in the Star Wars canon, right? Or the canon of Western literature and these sorts of things. Um, text and canon in our context refers to the text or the wording of the scriptures, right, that are contained in our Bible. Canon, briefly, simply gets at the, the, the books, which books belong in our Bible, which books were recognized by church historic to be divinely inspired by God, and therefore uh, belong to the complete record of the church's writings. Yeah, that's very good. And so, so uh, I've, I've, I think people would gather from this that there's a close, intimate relationship between the two. Uh, mm -hmm. We see the use of text and manuscripts, and which is what you guys do. You study manuscripts to determine sure. the original text. But the canon is closely related, um, is uh, very much so t to that. So, so for the average Christian, let's talk about your blog a little bit, because I think I, think, uh, I love your blog. I subscribe to it. It's very helpful for me, you know, just I'm not a specialist, even though I'd like to dive deeper, but, but talk about the blog for the, for the everyday Christian. Yeah, so, um, so textingcanon.org, uh, here, here's, the, here's the inspiration there. Um, I simply, and, and, and Peter Gurry and I simply got tired of finding the, the quality um, uh, and, and resources of, say, the historychannel.com, okay, or, or the, ar the high quality articles coming out from Newsweek and Time Magazine, you know, usually around Christmas and Easter, you know, I'm sure your listeners understand what I'm talking about, always casting a, sh a bit of shade on the authenticity and reliability of the Bible. Not, not just the, again, the history contained in the Bible. But what about, you know, the gotcha type articles like, um, you know, uh, I'll never forget this one in Newsweek from 2015, 
uh, came out, and the, the title was something so sensational that the Bible so misunderstood. It's a sin, you know, is what uh, uh, Eichenwald wanted us to think about, you know. And basically, he starts that article with, no one has ever read the Bible, you know. And his point was because the, ma the history, the manuscript history and the canon history of the Bible is so um, uh, chaotic, so to speak, that no one really has read the original Bible and this sort of thing. And Dr. Gurry and I got a little uh, inspiration from the quality, all right, the, the way that those articles are presented, right, because every average layperson can read those articles. They don't like what's in them, but they can read them. Right, right. <laughs> well, we wanted to say, well, yeah, so, so and understand them. So, so we wanted to say, okay, what can we do as scholars to create a bit of a trickle-down effect, but not, not trickle-down to the sense where we do highfalutin academic work and someone else takes the work and popularizes it. How can we at the Text and Canon Institute actually take sound academic research and make it as accessible as possible? Well, textingcanon.org then became a resource-driven website where we want to put out uh, not just articles that reflect the truth, but articles that are accessible. And we've tried to do this. There's actually a unique tab. At least I've never seen other sites do this. But if you click our articles tab on the, on the home page, uh, that'll give you the list of articles that are currently on the site. And you can actually search them according to three different levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. We've, we've tried to rank every article we publish on the site so that someone who comes to it says, man, I know nothing. I am, I am a novice of novices. Okay, well, click the beginner tab, and then all the articles that will show up below it will then be written uh, clearly at the beginner level you see. If you're looking for something that's maybe a bit more, maybe you're a pastor uh, and maybe, um, you know, your, your knowledge of the languages is, is a little fuzzy. You haven't gone to seminary in quite some time, but you could still maybe navigate a few articles that have, you know, original scripts in them and these sorts of things. Well, um, the advanced tab or, or the intermediate advanced tab might be for you, but we are trying to co uh, always contribute and, and, and publish a number of the beginner articles uh, for that widest uh, general audience possible. That's, that's excellent. Uh, as R.C. Sproul said, uh, take it to the pew. And uh, the other thing I thought of here was that, you know, we get really bad ideas that come out of the academy and influence our culture. We see that all over the place. Uh, let, that's right. let's, re let's reverse that. That's what you're doing here at the Texan Canon Institute. That's right. Take good scholarship right. Let, and bring it, bring it down to the level and get it out there to counter what's uh, being said out there. That's correct. Excellent. All right, well, we need yep. to go to a break, John, so we're going to do that right now. Friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with Dr. John Mead. We're talking about the Text and Canon Institute. All right, John, um, your last, in our last segment, you talked a little bit about resources for people and the lay people in the church, you know, the beginner's tab, as it were. And this is a perfect uh, way to talk about a, a subject that I actually haven't myself thought much about. And uh, you wrote a, a great uh, blog piece on the difference between the Protestant and the uh, Roman Catholic Old Testament canon. This is, this is just a great subject. So why don't you introduce folks to that, and then let's uh, flesh that out together. Yeah, great. So, so just kind of anecdotally, um, you know, my, my grand, one of my grandmothers uh, was Roman Catholic. 
And uh, so, so from a very early age, I, I did notice uh, that, that her Bible, which, which she did read pretty faithfully, her, her Bible uh, was quite a bit thicker than my own. And, uh, and, I, want, and, I, and I finally asked her, uh, you know, do you know why? And we started looking through the table of contents uh, of her Bible, and I recognized, wait, oh, there are more books here. And, and books that I had not known the titles of. So books like Tobit or Judith, Wisdom of Solomon. In her Bible, the next book was called Ecclesiasticus, though sometimes this book is called Sirach or, or even Ben Sirah. And then the books of First and Second Maccabees, which I came to realize later, provided a lot of intertestamental history of the Jewish people leading up to the New Testament period. And, uh, oh, and then there was another book that was also separated. It was called the Book of Baruch. And uh, now, again, maybe if you've read the Book of Jeremiah, you, you might think, oh, well, that name Baruch is familiar. That was the scribe of Jeremiah. Okay, so, so anyways, there were seven extra books in this, uh, in this Roman Catholic Bible. And, you know, going through life, didn't think too much of it. But then as you hit college and seminary days, all of a sudden— I'm getting questions. And so I like to say people chose this issue for me. <laughs> I didn't really say, hey, I'm going to dig into this. It was kind of a question that kept coming my way. And so I, I say the issue chose me. So canon and the Roman Catholic canon, as I've just described, they have seven extra books. The, the Protestant canon has 39. The Roman Catholic canon has 46 books. And the question is, how, are, how, how, was, how did that come about? How was that decided? One thing I try to shoot down early, Henry, and this, I think, surprises Christians of all stripes, and that is the, uh, there's no council that decides the canon of Scripture. That's right. really interesting. It, yes. You can't look to the Council of Nicaea, right, this, this grand ecumenical council where Christians of all persuasions and backgrounds come, bishops, I mean, come. They never decide the canon of Scripture at, at a place like Nicaea. Um, Later, later ecumenical councils simply do not address the question. So, so that, what that does is it kind of opens up, well, then how did we as Protestants get our 39 books of the Old Testament? And most, most Protestants are surprised to learn that really the, 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 the backing for this is the Jewish canon, which then kind of opens up another question. Okay, well, then how old is the Jewish canon and these yes. sorts of things? And, and then how did the Jews get their canon and, and all that? I'm going to cut through a lot of detail and just start with a Jewish historian named Josephus around 100 AD. Josephus says that the Jewish people have only ever had 22 books. And uh, that number is, is interesting. I don't think he's equating it with the alphabet, right? The Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. I don't think that's what's going on immediately, um, but that number assumes that there are books being counted as one. So if we think of our first and second Samuel, for example, the Jewish, the Jewish canon always has counted Sa the books of Samuel as one. OK, all the double books are one. Right. The books of Joshua or sorry, the books of Judges and Ruth counted as one. Right. Jeremiah and Lamentations counted as one. The 12 minor prophets were all included on one scroll well before the time of Josephus, and so therefore counted as one book. And that's how you get to 22 books, ultimately, 22 scrolls, really, uh, with, with that, that contained these double books uh, on one document. And so Josephus is saying that, look, the Jews have only had these 22 books written between the time of the death of Moses and the reign of King Artaxerxes, which is the king around the time of Esther. That's really interesting. So, so the question then is, um, is did, Christ, did early Christians latch on to this same canon? Did they ever latch on to the Jewish canon kind of as we know it? And, and we might expect that they would. I, I go back to Romans 3 verse 2 where Paul is talking about what are, the, what are the advantages, what are the benefits of being a Jew? And the very first thing he says is that they have the oracles of God. Which I thought was really interesting. Yes. Here's Paul setting the, kind of setting the tone here for how early Christians would go on to think about the, the boundaries of the oracles of God or the books divinely inspired. 
And so when you actually start to see which books are early Christians quoting from, so I, I assume our readers are good readers of the New Testament, how many times do we encounter a phrase like, just as it has been written in the New Testament? And yes. then a New Testament author, right, right, will go on to quote uh, a, a section out of an Old Testament book. And what we find is when we look at that globally, the, all of the quotations in the New Testament uh, that have that phrase, just as it is written or just as it's said or something like this, only the books of the Jewish canon are quoted. Now, we want to be clear, not all the books of the Jewish canon are quoted, right. but, only the books, but only the books of the Jewish canon are quoted, right? So in the New Testament, there's no quotation of Esther. There's no quotation of, say, Song of Songs or Ecclesiastes. But there are lots of quotations of Deuteronomy, of Psalms, Isaiah, right? All, uh, many of the prophets, the Proverbs even. Uh, Job is, is even quoted. So, so the question is, um, as, we, as we look at the way the New Testament authors quote from the Jewish canon or the Old Testament canon, what we're actually going to see is that they are restricted in what they will call Scripture right. or, or call written okay i think that's really important to say up front then the question is as we get outside of the new testament period so we get to a bishop named melito of sardis uh sardis was is in modern day turkey and uh and melito uh, a bishop there uh has a bit of angst he's trying to figure out which books are in the old testament which books belong to the law and the prophets he says and um, and what are the order of those books? He's he's concerned about these questions. Well, he goes back east. He probably goes back to the land of Israel, where he meets. There's this is a little bit of a debate. Does he meet with Jews or does he just meet with Christians from Israel? We're not really sure. But either way, he comes back with a list of books that, with the exception of the omission of Esther, basically mirrors our Protestant canon. Now, I was really interested by this. Because this, this really shows, I think, that the earliest Christians on record for the question of the canon, which books belong in our Bible, uh, actually go back and they consult the Jewish canon Excellent. primarily. Excellent. Well, it's very interesting. It is. Now, John, we're going to pause for a break for a moment. Yes. Don't, don't lose the momentum of that thought. Uh, and friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm your host, and I'm here with Dr. John Mead from the Text and Canon Institute. Now, in our last segment, we were talking about Old Testament canon. You know, John, the, uh, the, the question of you know, who decides, when was it decided, we, what we see in the New Testament, you pointed out, sort of intercanonical authentication, if you want to say, from the New Testament writers. So pick up, pick up more of that thought uh, of what you were sharing in the last segment, please. Yes, so, so and I probably should have said this earlier, but the, the question of canon, right, is, is uh, fundamentally can be boiled down to this, how did early Christians, early churches, recognize the voice of the shepherd Jesus, okay? They were learning to recognize in which books did God speak, which books did God divinely inspire. So canon is ultimately not a creation activity. It's not a selection activity. It is a recognition activity. It's recognizing what's already the case, what is already God speaking to his people, right, through these books. And the early Christians came, came to, I think, some conclusions pretty quickly based on criteria that they were, that, that God did not speak in all books, right? Just because a 
a, a religious work was written down doesn't mean that God spoke there, okay? At least in the same way, in a special way, as he did in the canonical book. So I just want to be clear about that uh, before we move forward. But there were disagreements among Christians as to how to recognize where God spoke, okay? And I want to boil it down quickly. We've talked, we talked in the last segment about the Jewish canon criterion. Did the Jews include a book in their canon? That was one major criterion that early Christians used. So we, Jer, St. Jerome, for example, uh, expounds this. But surprisingly, a number of Eastern bishops surpri- uh, uh, propound this. So uh, St. Athanasius of Alexandria and St. Gregory of Nazianzus. And I, and I could go on to some 10 or so other early Eastern Christians that propound this theory, this view, that the, early, that the church should take for its canon of Scripture the Jewish canon, you see. And that's the way Protestants go. So to cut to the end, yes. Protestants basically are in that stream, all right? But there's another stream, and you have to, we have to ultimately put together how did the Roman Catholic canon and Bible come together. And it, here, here's a misconception. It's not just the Council of Trent in 1546. I, I grew up as a Protestant, and I learned that, that Trent, this, this, this Catholic council, met in 1546 and published the Roman Catholic Bible for the first time. Well, that's, that's not right, and I, and I think we should probably nip that in the bud as soon as possible, okay? Because really, we can go back to St. Augustine, who's kind of my homeboy, Henry. I <laughs> I love reading Augustine's Confessions. I like yes. reading Augustine's City of God. But Amen. we have different views of the canon of Scripture. And Augustine makes it very plain. His criteria is, or criterion is, the church, the church should include uh, for its books uh, those books that are read and accepted in the majority of churches. Or in the authoritative churches, yeah, you see. Yeah. And that 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 means Augustine thinks that the church decides the Old Testament canon. And that and in no place when he's talking about canon criteria, or again, how to recognize God's voice in the scriptures, he he's he nowhere mentions the Jewish canon or the Hebrew canon as the criterion, you see. So what this did is in the fourth century, it led to two different ways of coming at this question and i just want to i just want to revisit which one i think is right if we have if we have time um because jerome jerome on the one hand and augustine on the other they are corresponding in letters over this question there is a clear disagreement for how to 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 come at or, or, or how to decide upon what the canon should be and I, I just want to try to lay out very clearly, how would I decide between whether Jerome or Augustine is right? And Augustine, um, or let's start with Jerome. Jerome's view of just the Jewish canon, we can actually find evidence, again, from the second century in canon lists, lists of biblical books, where Jerome's canon theory is actually confirmed. OK, so if I was just making the argument based on earliest possible tradition to discern, I would be able to conclude that Jerome's canon has precedent in the record, whereas Augustine's canon doesn't have the same earliest precedent, you see. So if I was just going to leave it up to those clear evidences of canon lists, Jerome's view has the stronger pedigree, if I can put it that yes. way. Yes. And again, again, that's the way that's the view that the Protestant canon eventually grows out of. And then again, I think you bring in then some more kind of circumstantial pieces in some way. The New Testament authors only cite books from that same canon, right, as scripture. Now they may yeah. allude to other books, but they only cite as scripture, scripture books that are yeah, books are from the Jewish canon. So Exactly. So anyways, we, and we, we could go back further, but I think that kind of gives the, the flavor of how this type of discussion should go. Well, John, I know you're not going to believe this, but we've come down to the end already. You've just given them the tip of the iceberg, and That's I want to encur- encourage folks 
to go read the article that you wrote about this and explore Text and Canon Institute. Pray for the ministry that you guys are doing and also for the academic uh, work that you're doing there. Th thank you for coming on the show, John. Let let's have you back on again and do it again and talk about some more stuff. What do you say? That'd be wonderful, Henry. All right. God, God bless you. Friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We, wanna, we do want to urge you to pray for the Text and Canon Institute, Dr. Mead and Dr. Gurry, and the work that they're doing. It's very important. Visit their website and support their ministry if you can. You can trust what the Bible says. You can trust the books that God has given us. And thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth today.